It's a pleasure to be here, and the poems will arrive shortly. <laughs> I think if I had to pick one word that would be synonymous to poetry, in a lot of ways I would go to the word gratitude because it is in that sense of gratitude that I am able to observe the images that come my way, whether they be images from my dreams, or images from things that people tell me, or things in nature. And I'm very grateful to see my family in the audience, because I haven't seen them in a while. And I'm also very grateful that I'll be performing a, a play in three days, and I've never really performed a long play, so it's sort of like throwing myself off a cliff in a lot of ways, but hey, I'm enjoying the jump. And I also want to thank my friend Lamont, I call him La Mancha, for um, being with me and for the long friendship. And he will appear with the poem shortly. <laughs> <laughs> and there will be there will be times in my reading where I might take a long pause for a variety of reasons. One, the awkwardness and the slowness of finding a poem when my eyes get a little tired and I can no longer find the page number. The other is sensing around the room to see what's the next poem that I'm supposed to read. And thirdly, and more importantly, having a chance to take you all in is really crucial to me. So if you're wondering what I'm doing when I'm quietly staring, it's that. I grew up in the town of Amatlan in central Mexico, and I was very influenced by all the nature that was around me. And I remember around three years old, I had this experience where I, I really felt that everything was alive and everything had a voice of its own. And I would go into a spontaneous trance-like state and start speaking to a flower. And I really wasn't thinking that I was reciting a poem or doing something particularly special, but more that I was engaged in a conversation with a jasmine bush. And my mom would record one side of the conversation. And there's a saying in, in Spanish, I don't know if it translates into English, that great doctors have bad handwriting, which was certainly the case for my mother. So I've never been able to go back to those <laughs> poems uh, that started when I was three years old. But I still remember that nature being a real driving force. And then I discovered the work of Mary Oliver years later. And so the first poem of mine that I'm going to read is a tribute to her work. And when I met her in Provincetown, she said two things that have impacted me greatly. One is, Remember a Kiwa behind every man and every woman, there is a pool of sorrow. And the other was, every poem is a single poem, a single practice, a devotion to attention. And so I'm constantly asking myself, how can I really cultivate that in my life? And I also have felt really grateful for the teachers that have come along my way, one of them being Frank Quinn that has led me through many revisions of my of new poems. And so I want to start off with a poem by him that I love. I have been given this pen for praise. Let those with black pens tell their sorrows. But this pen is a horse of blue ink and I, its drunken rider, singing and laughing through the darkest night I've known. Why should I not be drunk? Why should I not laugh? For even on a night as dark as this, 
There are lovers promising foolish things with their bodies. They bank their secret fires and burn all night like logs. No matter how cold the morning, their house will be warm. I love that poem because of the hunger that it expresses for love. And when I asked Franklin, what was your inspiration for this poem, he told me a Native American story in which a, a woman fell in love with a lake, and one day she realized that the lake had been transported to the wrong place that was getting all murky. And so she decided to transport the lake back to its home by cupping her hands into the lake and bringing it back to the right place, drop by drop. And then he said to me, and that's what I feel poetry can do. We're bringing the lake of poetry to the people that we love. And again, I really want to thank my parents for giving me that sense of hunger to follow what I love. And this particular poem is for my father. The Coyote Straits. The sky provides room for the moon to move the moon for my eye to linger, and this for me to ponder on the privilege of invisible and visible sight. Yet if you wish to find out about this freedom, if you attempt to track me, do not speak to me. Speak to what makes me hungry. Follow the traces of what I love. I'm going to do it again. The Coyote Trace. The sky provides room for the moon to move, the moon for my eye to linger, and this for me to ponder on the privilege of invisible and visible sight. Yet if you wish to find out about this freedom, if you attempt to track me, do not speak to me. Speak to what makes me hungry follow the traces of what I love. One of the great things that influenced me besides nature was growing up without cable TV because I was forced to create my own images instead of watching television. And in that creation of those images, and in the slowness of conversation and rounds of coffee, in the slowness to come to a dinner table where instead of talking about a particular program, you talked about what you dreamt last night, or what really affected you during the day. That's where poetry began to live for me. It's it was entering into a circular space where time, if it existed, could stretch and bend and go backwards. And that has its, its disadvantages, too. It's part of the reason why I'm so spacey and I still manage to blow off important appointments because of living in that timeless sort of space. So I'm just now learning that watches exist and that things potentially are three-dimensional and whatnot. But this is a poem coming out of that for, for my parents and for uh, the way that we begin in a lot of mornings. And I'm so glad to see you, bro. I wasn't expecting that. Getting up. This morning we come again to our coffee clutch. I'm too busy as usual imagining the eternal body of the sky still half dreaming of birds spawned by a silver blue light. To brush my own teeth or examine the newspaper headlines, each in dire need of my attention. My father rises early. The splinters of his day are dismissed like the rainwater my golden retriever shakes out of its furrowed eaves. He lets our sleeping dogs lie by our feet lulled by our voices as he opens one more Murakami book and reads aloud. I shut my eyes and see horned beasts that change the color of their coats from autumn to winter. 
the cat draws a ring of sound around our reading ritual so that it may remain unbroken for a little longer. Then my mother, still filled with the snow of sleep, descends from the staircase moving royally, poised in her worn violet pajamas. She kisses us and demands the perfect coffee from La Selva, complains about the absence of evaporated milk and an almost hard green banana required to snap as it peels. A shaft of sunlight crowns her yawning face. My mother and I talk of praise as a form of healing and the succulent sex stories of our friends. My father pipes in with sparse sentences and puts one more slice of amaranth bread on the table. Our words water the lilies of conversation. Eventually we will return to our work, one more patient to heal, another sentence turned inside out, an arugula outgrows its pot, the joys and grievances of our labor, our sleeping infants that will wake and ask for food. I want to wander out of the house alone, into the outdoor market, but my stiff body and the cracked cobblestones of my town, and the cracked cobblestones of my town, where my voice also cracked, prevent me. Yet now this day trudges forward with the slow grace of an elephant. I write poetry to rip the hands of my clock until only a circle remains, making time for time again. After so much conversation, silence begins to gather in the buckets of the unsaid.
beyond, beyond, always beyond, sailing to the horizon, no boundaries on the scene or in the sunlit sky. My journey is always beginning, and that in itself keeps me content. But if indeed one day I reach the shore, or fly like a phoenix to meet the source of light, or make my poem complete, and weave my words into a cloak of pattern, and go back to the irreversible word from which all words came forth, then I'd be silent, not daring to utter a word for fear of staining the delicate silk of its totality. In the meantime, here I come, wandering, pulling on the oars, and there's plenty of songs to keep me going. There's a place where language ceases. A place that I believe is evoked in the myth of the Tower of Babel, where all these people were constructing a tower speaking the same language, and at one point they got into dis disputes, and so the, the tower scattered, and language was also scattered. And I want to respect that we have many differences between us. I want to respect cultural differences as real, but I also want to respect the possibility of a silent language, a silent empathy where we can all meet. And that space for me is poetry, but I think that it has many different shapes and names, call it what you will. As I was mentioning before, some of my poems come from my dreams, and this is a long poem that evolved out of several different dreams. I will read a fragment. both to myself and to other 
other people. And the reason why I, I don't go to those places that often is because I really, I don't want to be pitied or necessarily for people to assume that because I'm in a wheelchair I've gone through much, much more pain or something really heroic because I think pains have all kinds of varieties of manifesting and they're all equally valid. I'm not sure if I've gone through more or less pain than anybody else. But within that there is a certain, uh, be because I'm human, I suffering is also part of the game. And one of the things that I'm working on exposing is the taboo that I felt present invisibly at an unconscious level in relation to sexuality in wheelchairs. And I've, I've felt that in some cases there's been an unconscious assumption that because you're in a wheelchair you are incapable of having sex or you are an asexual being. And that, that has been a, a very painful experience to know how to navigate that without judging people. The clearest experience that I can remember of it where it was very explicit was there was one person that was in a very sexual sort of mood when I was in my first year of college. And she was basically cuddling up with everybody that she could. And, but all the people were getting tired of it, and I was like, well, actually, you can, can cuddle up with me. <laughs> and what she responded was, no, but you can't. And it, it was not meanness on her part, but it made me aware that that assumption is a very real one. And so, to grow out of that, I want to read a little. This was one of the happiest experiences of my life, so I'm sort of asking whatever powers of the universe out there to grant something like that again not too long from now. So once, she pushed my wheelchair into the woods before I could tuck myself under the heavy blanket of metaphysical subject. A midsummer night descended suddenly upon us and we slipped into bodies of moss and leaf braided by the thin hairs of the rain her hair a labyrinth of orange light, her eyes alert and dark like skittish mares, the turn of her voice warm and bright like autumn. I, with her in my arms, became at once a line of smoke where sky meets sea over the world's curved blue lip, and one coherent piece of cosmic clay wanted for the first time, not in spite of my body, but because of it, everyone myself opening into gardens of motion and silence. Then, like a smiling skull cut out of tissue paper and made from china, for the, for the time when the dead laugh with the living, our days floated through the night. So that's the way I like to roll around. My mom is also in the audience. I can feel her laughing already. Laughing me as a kid. Wonderful. Yeah. 
it, it was really beautiful to grow up in a context where I would get to hear my mother on the phone every day saying, so is it more anger or jealousy that you feel when she was about to give a homeopathic remedy to one of her patients? And that kind of constant inquiry into somebody's well-being and that concern to unleash potential in a person and uh, see illness not as not as a bunch of fragmented symptoms, but as a constellation linked to a whole person. That practice has influenced me greatly as well. And so I, I still continue to ask those same homeopathic questions in my poems. They trip their way in. And it, it can start off with something really mundane like, is your mucus yellow or green? And then go into jealousy and anger and love. The homeopath. Is your pain unpredictable, quick and sharp like a hummingbird, or slow and familiar like an old house? Do you ache at dawn or at sundown? Do you shiver and twitch like a rabbit, or are you still like an oyster? Are you thirsty? If you had a choice, would you take a pinch of the ocean salt or bite into a sugar cane? Do you feel sad like a rose denied water, calm like a bear dreaming, disoriented like a seal in a desert, angry like a poisonous toad? Do you yield to the touch like the sheep's wool or harden like granite? I want to speak to the heart of your pain, to know where it took root and began. I want to give you the colors of the rainbow in imponderable doses. I want to match it with whatever shade is inside of you. I want to dazzle your pain so it may leap out and begin to dance. after I wrote it or in the process of writing it, I probably needed a homeopathic remedy as a result, but it wasn't too serious. Evening Rain from Mary Oliver. To know for the first time fire and water are not enemies, only twins knighted in the braids of lightning. To unlatch your mouth and unfurl your tongue for the tingling of each drop as it enters and becomes you. To move towards the rain and be drenched by it deliberately is a reckless thing. And yet you suspect for a few moments you are living inside the skins of the swallows, your hair and their feathers ruffling simultaneously under the same thunder-chiseled sky. You know you have been waiting once again for heaven itself, trickling slowly down into your body. So as I was having that ecstatic experience of getting my wheelchair soaking wet, I probably afterward came down for, with a cold. But that's the price of beauty, I guess. One thing I haven't brought into the room in a while is my Spanish tongue, so it's time to call the room. Camaleón. Estoy en plena desnudez. El viento me arrastra. 
Abajo un mendigo se arrodilla ante el fuego, descubro que es solo mi propia verdad. Como la lluvia que llega al río, soy la gota que se desvanece al fundirse con el agua. En lo alto vuela la gaviota. I am in full nakedness, the wind drives me. Below a beggar kneels before the fire. I discover he is but my own truth. Like the drop that reaches the river as it merges with the water. High above the seagull soars. That was a poem that I wrote really early on when I was about 10 or something like that, and I still get some joy out of returning to it because there's all these different parts of myself and all this chaos, and I know that in the middle of that there's a seagull flying that can see all of the parts, and it's comforting to know that in the middle of the chaos. I've been reflecting a little bit about what's different with the language, Spanish and English, for me. And I think that English is a much easier language to compress. So you can say, fasten seatbelt. And in Spanish, you can't get a, you can do it, but you can't get away with it as easily somehow. You need to say, kindly fasten your seatbelt, or there's an abbreviation, come to the smoke out. And at least in the signs that I've seen in Spanish, the equivalent would be, come to a conference to cure your smoking addiction. <laughs> so. And by the same token, because there's a certain compression in English, I find it's a very beautiful language to write in because it can narrow me more quickly into the epicenter of the emotion that I'm trying to convey. So I appreciate moving back and forth between the two worlds even though I get culturally jet-lagged pretty easily by the differences and the similarities. Valid passport, that one whining, the infant with budding fingernails, soft tissue, delicate teeth, the infant that curls up to suck at the breast of darkness, that can barely extrude a few filaments of breath and sound. That's not me, that identity, that memory that still speaks to me, that voice that settles into my body without being asked, is no longer valid. My fingers are long, my hands are strong, my teeth avid to squeeze the juice from the world and relish it. I need to renew my passport. I put my hand in my pocket. Here it is. Tight, young dreamer, slow, long-haired, with a shadow of a growing mustache. Nationality, half Mexican, half gringo, half tiger, half deer. Date of birth, September 14th under the sway of summer and mercury, age negotiable, sex developed, place of birth, my mother's womb, place of origin, Amatlan, the village of the Amate trees, custodians of fireworks and fiestas, morning songs, out of tune priests, and women who make tortillas with tender hands. Observations, he is stunned by life, picky, fixed in his ideas and his dreams are volatile. Hobby, a left, hobby, aviator in the realms of Morpheus. Status, a left-handed lefty. Subject's declaration, I prefer to be dirty. I want the dust of inspiration coating my skin. Addictions, the fruit of the coffee tree and the cacao. Who are you, murmurs the infant of soft tissue and milk teeth. I reply, I am a Kiwa. And I want to thank you all for listening and being here. 
As I'm looking out, who knows what lines of poetry I will write mysteriously inspired by some of your silhouettes, some of the songs or the poetry that you have carried into the room, some of your own stories, which maybe some part of me is silently taking in as we speak because I, I believe that poetry is a dance and a conversation and that's what I really like to be talking with you all. And that's part of what gives a lot of meaning to my life. So thank you. This is, this is for the dance between us. Dancing between times. I'm searching for a light poem, one that will nestle easily in the palm of your hand and grow very tall until it's a tree to draw from it a diaphanous leaf on which I could write a poem, may it turn into a firefly in the palm of your hand. <laughs> 